Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and High Tech Oki. Coming up on DTNS, bad news for vertical farms, why chat GPT caused Google to go into a panic, and how Mastodon could survive its success. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, December 22nd, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, uh, my friends, we are we are heading towards the holiday break. Only two more live shows of DTNS left before we get into our holiday specials. But the tech news hasn't stopped. We'll tell you why in the quick hits. Game on, everyone. Google and the NFL announced that YouTube will offer the NFL Sunday ticket subscription for out-of-market NFL games starting with the 2023 season. Customers can purchase Sunday ticket through YouTube TV or a la carte through YouTube Prime Time channels. The Wall Street Journal sources say that YouTube will pay $2 billion per season as part of a seven-year agreement. Cora launched a beta for Platform for Open Exploration. That's PFO, but they're just calling it PO, where people can ask questions and have a back and forth dialogue with chatbots. PO will access several models, including ChatGPT, and will introduce a system for organizing, uh, for organizations rather, to submit their own models in the near future. PO currently has a wait list for access. And then insert nevermore joke. <laughs> the memory chip maker Micron announced it will cut 10% of its workforce. This comes as it's reported it lost $0.04 cents per share on revenue that was down 47% on the year in its fiscal Q1 to $4.09 billion. Both missed analyst estimates, which is probably why we're cutting. Last month, Micron announced it would cut chip produc production by 20% and now expects to reduce its capital budget for new plants by 42% in the year to $7 billion. FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried, often referred to as SBF, was extradited from jail in the Bahamas Wednesday and has arrived in New York City. He is charged with eight criminal counts, including fraud, conspiracy, and money laundering, and to put up, what, like $250 million in bail. Yeah. In related cases, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission filed complaints against Alameda Research's ex-CEO Caroline Ellison and FTX's ex-CTO Gary Wang for their roles in alleged fraud that used FTX customer deposits for risky investments made by Alameda. Wang and Ellison both pleaded guilty to related federal charges of multiple counts of fraud themselves. Meta's latest update to the Quest 2 headset boosts the maximum GPU frequency 7%, up from 490 megahertz to 529. 525, rather. The headset will automatically increase the frequency if it detects that an app can benefit from it. That results in better image quality when using dynamic foveation, for example. The boost works with current titles, but developers can update their apps to boost resolution as well. Sarah, do you, do you think uh, SBF put up, uh, tried to put up his bail in crypto? You know, like <laughs> first, my first question is like, it? can you bail yourself out of jail? Apparently so. Yeah. Uh, second is, can you bail yourself out with crypto? I have some FTT now. They're going to be worth a lot if you if I win my case. I'm just I'm just saying. All right, uh, let's talk about food. We've covered vertical farms before on the show as a possible advance in food production, especially for urban areas. Uh, Wired's Matt Reynolds has an interesting article out called Vertical Farming Has Found Its Fatal Flaw. Europe's energy crisis is forcing companies to switch strategies or close down. The industry's future hangs in the balance. The short version is energy prices rose in Europe from 58% uh, or by 58%. What was once a very manageable 25% of operating costs for vertical farm sprayers, LEDs, and such became almost half. A secondary issue is that vertical farms are expensive to build compared to traditional farms, and investors are less tolerant to long lead times to profitability than what they used to be. Yes, yeah, so you might say, well, all right, is there a solution? The solution could be to charge more, but inflation is making consumers less tolerant of paying extra for produce, especially leafy greens that vertical farms do really well at. With energy costs rising, vertical farms' advantages are less pesticide use, less water use. That might mean that vertical farms' best bet is to head to arid countries, 
perhaps in the Middle East, where they also have stable electricity prices. Yeah, I think this is an interesting example of how uh, we, we sort of take for granted certain things that make it possible for innovations to happen, like affordable energy. Um, you know, it's one conversation to have about emissions and all of that, and it's an important conversation to have, don't get me wrong. Uh, but the price of energy being low has allowed us to try a bunch of things, very similar to how battery technology is a break on what we can do with technology right now that I don't think anybody really thinks about because there just isn't an alternative to the lithium ion battery right now that's, that's worth anything. Uh, when energy prices go up, suddenly something like vertical farms, which has a lot of advantages and a lot of things it can do for certain areas, isn't uh, as possible because now the the profitability and the price point uh, have, have all changed. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things here that's a key point is that these farms are expensive and more difficult to build. So I think like with regular farming, prices go up. Um, you kind of stop doing a certain thing. When they come back down, you restart because it's not necessarily cost prohibitive to actually get started in regular farming. But because the vertical farms actually cost more to produce and start, uh, that could be a reason to where, you know, th this inflationary hike that we're having right now might just say, hey, we're, we're going to we're going to move elsewhere to try this technology out. Yeah, I, I it's sort of disheartening to, to hear a story like this because you go, oh, vertical farms. How cool you can, you know, farm in urban areas that makes it. Uh, closer to the people who might eventually mm -hmm. buy those leafy greens, it you know it 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 makes it possible to to grow things that would otherwise need lots of land in, in you know it, and lots it, of water, yeah. lots of land, lots of water. Yeah, like typical farming stuff. It I mean I know it's not the same as putting solar panels on your house, but it's it it kind of reminds me of that. Of people saying, well, but yeah, I get it. I get why it's so great. But there was a point, and we've kind of come past that at this point but there was a point where people were like but i like i'm not going to recoup my costs really besides just sort of doing the right thing and so i think that we kind of get into a conversation like that with the vertical farming industry is like doing the right thing doing the thing that is going to taste better and is just healthier for everybody if it costs too much isn't going to stick well, and I wonder what would have happened if this energy crisis had happened later in vertical farms evolution, assuming it caught on, right? If the if the sunk costs were in there, uh, you you might have a different story going on. But right now, it's like what what you were saying. There, it's it's easier to just adapt in a traditional farming situation, whereas vertical farms just they haven't built up their infrastructure enough. They haven't gotten past that part where they they can say like, okay, even we can absorb a little energy cost because we've already paid for the infrastructure. They're still building out. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that's, you know, hopefully hopefully that won't last forever and won't keep these out forever. And I think the Middle East is a great place for, for them to incubate uh, for a while until maybe energy prices come back down. You might be saying, but when Sarah brought up solar panels, like, yeah, why don't they just put solar panels on the vertical farms? It, the fact is that also adds to the cost, right? The upfront yeah. cost, right? That's it would right. pay for itself over yeah. time. It's not the pay for itself over time that's the problem. It's the like, like, yeah, but I don't know that we can afford to build that now. Yeah, can you can you make two dollars in ten years, or can I make a dollar fifty next month? Yeah, that's that's what it comes down to. Yeah, and the and the farmers around the place that I grew up are like, yeah, I can give you a dollar fifty next month. Uh, yeah, I don't have to wait for my vertical farm to pay off. So there you go. New York Times reports that Google issued a code red. Apparently, that's a buzzword in the enterprise these days. It's getting all code red on things not not in the same way as the movie i hope uh this kind of code red is like get get on board let's all let's all figure out how to solve this problem and google issued theirs over the rise of chat gpt google ceo sundar pichai directed teams in google's research trust and safety division to assist in developing ai prototypes and products just bringing more people into the process folks inside now google have been debating whether chat gpt could get good enough to replace Google. Uh, instead of searching through a list of results, you just ask ChatGPT for what you want and get it. So right now, at the moment, the answer is no, since ChatGPT still has a hard time distinguishing fact from fiction. But it's going to get better, and at some point, it will be as good as Google search results, which also sometimes surface incorrect information. Google has its own version of ChatGPT called Lambda. What is that? Lambda. 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 Yeah. Um, the, 
the one employee there was one employee that was convinced that this was sentient. I remember that from a few months yeah, ago. Yeah, okay, that's that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but Google has held it back from public use because it's of its failings. What do we think? Should Google make search a good version of Chat GPT before Chat GPT becomes a best version of search? That is a tongue twister of a sentence right there. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but it's, it's a, a tongue twister a, of a yeah. problem too. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a good I question. I say the answer is is yes. Um, I, I have this saying: when things change, change things. Um, uh, we we know that Google didn't go out with Lambda for they were worried about what if we are racist? What if we you know we're giving wrong information? There are reasons why they didn't do what they do. Um, but Chat GPT has shown that hey, this is really really you know um, some next level technology. Um, so Google, they, they need to get on with it. Like, so they called this thing a code red that like, we, we need to go and look at this now. Um, because I do see, uh, you know, when, when I play with chat GPT, it is the closest thing to the bridge computer from Star Trek that I've seen. Um, and, and that, I think for a lot of folks with AI assistance, that's kind of what you want. You literally can just have a conversation with, you know, um, you know, an AI and it gives you the answers, um, you know, you know, in just a conversational way. Um, if Google is not thinking about that, and I believe that they are, they need to be, um, because that is where search is going ultimately, in my opinion. Yeah, th this, um, what, <laughs> what I imagine is going on uh, behind the scenes at Google, and I don't work there, so I don't know, but I can see, you know, a, a lot of folks in a, in a conference room somewhere saying, you know, let's 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 be conservative about this. Let's make sure that this tool um, is is ripe for the masses, which it isn't. Our, our tool, Lambda, in that case, and let's make sure that you know we're not just unleashing something that's going to break or otherwise going to be misused. And then you've got Chat GPT that no one can stop talking about, and all the Google people saying, "No, come on, we've been doing this for years." We are also doing this. Um, so, yeah, if you're, and especially people talking about, hmm, future of search. Okay, this might be where we're going. And there's no question that Google has already thought about this. They're just not the ones getting all the headlines. I mean, it, this reminds me in some ways of Netflix saying, we want to become HBO before HBO becomes us, right? Uh, mm. go Google realizing, well, crap, we need Lambda to get good enough to be our, our in our search engine before chat GPT gets good enough to that people stop using Google search, which would be devastating. That's where all of Google's money comes from, is from ads on search. Right. Uh, so they not only need to get Lambda good enough, they also need to figure out how to monetize Lambda because that's a different situation than a list of search results, right? Uh, it, so when, you, when I start thinking about it that way, it reminds me of IBM looking at this new Apple computer that people are buying and realizing, crap, we need to have a PC, hurry up and figure that out uh, and get it out there. I mean, it just goes to show that, that Google is no longer and hasn't been for a long time a new company. It is it is an old, slow company. And this newer startup, OpenAI, has passed it in something that I think Google thought, well, we, we have really good AI chops, which they do. Uh, but they they move too cautiously. They move too slowly than the smaller competitor could here. That doesn't mean I think ChatGPT is ready to replace search tomorrow. Uh, but it's a race now to see who can get it good enough to do that. And I, f I don't know what the timeline is, but I fully think that you're going to get your wish, Rob, that you're going to have that Star Trek-like experience sooner or later. I, I wonder... Um if Google is looking at this and they're serious enough about it that they may make an acquisition, <laughs> if if they're if Lambda isn't where it needs to be, do they just try to go out and acquire ChatGPT? Mm. I, I haven't heard any rumors on that. I haven't heard any news, but well, it's something Chat that kind of ChatGPT is just owned by OpenAI, which is funded by one Elon Musk. So, uh, yeah, funny. it's 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 unlikely. But I see where you're going with this. Yeah, um, yeah. I, could they I, buy somebody else who's got some chops that they be, could throw in there? Yeah, I mean, I, that's the, when mm. you're a company the size of Google, you know, it's like, what do we have? Google, Meta, Amazon. I mean, they're the Apple, Apple. There's a few companies in that category where it's like, everybody's suspicious. You know, hmm, you got your own tool. Do you Google? Well, you know, is it as good as chat GPT? Open AI made it, not Google. If mm -hmm. Google is the parent company of a tool like this, 
well, you get a lot of, you know, finger wagging uh, from folks that, I mean, there, there is that anyway, you know, just about the technology in general. But um, I think it's a blessing and a curse to be a company that is mm. as powerful as Google is to be able to say, we are and possibly have the better version of this technology, but we have to be so careful about releasing it because anything goes wrong and it turns into, you know, Google's evil. Also, keep an eye out on pedals. We talked about pedals earlier on DTNS. It's from, it's backed by a Hugging Faces big science project. It's open source and distributed. Uh, it's that horse that's in third place right now and among the three we're talking about. There's more in the race, but let's just simplify things, right? Uh, and, and it's coming out on from the outside. Uh, it's not impossible that pedals de develop something that passes chat GPT and Lambda because it's, it's even more nimble uh, and creates that ability to use the web openly because they have the least uh, reservations on research, whereas OpenAI kind of, it's doing some, you know, some things publicly, but keeping a lot of stuff private uh, and Google's keeping almost everything private. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is, this is an interesting race to watch. When people ask you, uh, what are you excited about in the future of technology? This is one of those things that you can say, you know what, those those chatbots and, and how they're going to improve search and who's going to get there first. I think that's that's a fun one to watch. Yeah, this is uh, I'm definitely uh, looking at this because, like I said, I, I've always dreamed of being able to hit something on my chest or hold up a tricorder and just talk to a computer. And it gives me all the information of the world that I ask it. Um, so if Google, if, if they're thinking about this and I understand the mm -hmm. issues that they would have with we can't be wrong because we're Google, but they need to start a skunk works up and they need to get going and just explain to Earth that, hey, this is experimental technology. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, you still go to Google to do your search. This thing is under alphabet. It's something different until they actually decide it's good enough to bring it into the fold. Rock in a hard place, though, right? Because yeah. uh, if Pedals is bad, people go, oh, weird open source project. If ChatGPT is bad, they're like, no, nah, who's open AI? If Google's bad, blowback. Oh, yeah. Instant yeah. condemnation yeah. and blowback. So. I, mean, I think if they were, well, I was about to say, if they were smart, uh, a lot of people at Google are very smart, but... If you could somehow make Lambda or whatever it becomes in the future part of Google's assistant, then mm -hmm. you're That's getting the somewhere. That's the idea, right? Then yeah, you're getting absolutely. somewhere because you're not replacing search. You're saying you have lots of options and we win you know, 100% of the time. And it's already in there. Um, Google is putting the technology from Lambda and other things into things. It's just putting them in slower than yep. you know, the, this race is, is going suddenly. Well, folks, as we get towards the end of the year, uh, we have a lot of last things of the year to check out, and you don't want to miss them. If you're a patron, uh, be sure to check out Roger's last column of the year. He shares his thoughts on a comic series illustrated entirely by image generation, by by a te an image text-to-image generator. Uh, it's cool. Find it at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, Mastodon, having a bit of a moment. Uh, monthly active users have jumped from 300,000 in October to 2.5 million in November. A lot of people signed up for Mastodon in a month. That's still really small compared to Twitter's 350 plus million users, but it is a huge spike, an 800% rise in a very short period of time. This is a unique challenge though, since no one organization actually runs Mastodon. It's an implementation of the open source activity pub protocol. That implementation is administered by a German nonprofit at joinmastodon.org. Most servers are run on a voluntary basis. If they take money at all, it's usually through PayPal donations or a Patreon, but in almost all cases, you don't need to even pay a dollar to use it. Yeah, each, each instance's admin is responsible for everything. Uh, the, the maintenance, the moderation, the legal compliance. So things like Digital Millennium Copyright Act, GDPR, COPA, any local laws in each market where you're made available, which if you're on the internet, you're in all the markets. Uh, not all of the work is about laws, though. Each instance has a community that the admins are responsible for moderating. And all the drama that comes with moderating humans uh, comes with doing it. Smaller the community, the easier it is to manage. Uh, but as we said, 
it's getting bigger. Uh, and of course, there's all the maintenance, the uptime, the storage, all of that gets more difficult and grows as your server gets more popular. All of these things take time, effort, and resources to deal with. They're dealable. You just have to increase the amount of time, effort, and resources you apply to them. And that usually means money. Mastodon instances, by and large, do not take advertising. They rely on volunteers and donations, and that can be difficult to scale. Yeah, so bigger organizations are joining in, uh, which could take some pressure off of those smaller instances. Uh, for example, Mozilla announced it will launch Mozilla.social starting in 2023. Tumblr said it would add interoperability with ActivityPub. That's the protocol used by Mastodon servers. The Guardian noted a crypto startup called Social Coop, which runs a Japanese-based Mastodon instance called Pawu, P-A-W-O-O, which has 800,000 users along with two other instances. And in fact, TechDirt's Mike Masnick thinks that Mastodon might be about to have its Gmail moment, which is, you know, high praise. That moment when webmail went from being just kind of slow and limited and... Yeah, you know, it only does so much to the way most people just do email and think about email. So what do we think here? Do, should we forget about whether it should be a Twitter successor and think of it as something totally different? And if it's mostly volunteer run, can Mastodon actually scale and how? Rob, you have a, a, some experience with scale, I think, right? So... <laughs> You know, Mastodon essentially is a federated service, uh, and, and federated services are hard because you have multiple people, and in the case of Mastodon, multiple people who generally aren't paid who are doing all of the upkeep and maintenance and all, and all of that work. I think that one of the reasons that Mastodon is, uh, you know, and the main reason Mastodon is seeing the growth that it is is because of all the stuff that is happening at Twitter. So there's a couple of things that I think, uh, you, know, you know, could happen. Um, what I think is likely is that it's going to be one of these larger organizations that has the funds to actually stand up an instance and just actually pay people to keep that thing up and running. And you may still see Uber growth there to where it's just going to grow, uh, you know, what is it? 800 percent, um, you know, over, over a month and a half. Um, I think that that's ultimately what it's going to take. Uh, I, I, I told a story uh, in the pre-show about how I logged out of Mastodon on an accident. Couldn't remember what ser what instance I was logged into. <laughs> Had to text somebody to find out, hey, what's my you know my Mastodon address so they could tell it back to me, based off of uh, tweets yeah. they, or tweets of of, uh, of you know posts, posts. That they could see, and let me know uh, how to log back into my own account. Um, that isn't scalable at the rate they're growing. Um, you know, just all these, uh, you know, federated services uh, that are out there. But I do believe that if like s someone with, you know, actual money behind them comes in and says, hey, we're going to productize this, you know, we, we may make it ad supported or, or just do something to where it's one giant massive server that could literally have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users on that one instance. I think that might actually be the thing that maybe pushes uh, Mastodon over because they've got to they've got to react and capture the Twitter people who are leaving Twitter or who are just looking for something other than Twitter um, relatively soon. The Twitter thing, I don't think is going to be a thing for a long time. I think eventually Twitter will kind of settle back into what Twitter has always been. Um, and if they've missed that moment, then you might go back to see the growth go back to what it was like before the Twitter fiascos started to happen. Yeah, I, I think the challenge with Mastodon, uh, th th let me start here. The advantage of Mastodon, one of the big advantages of Mastodon is because you can choose different servers, you can choose different flavors of experience. Yeah. So if you want a more like freewheeling, let people post whatever they want, you can find a server that allows that. Or if you want something that's more locked down, keep all the bad words off, you can do that. Uh, if... It's fine that Mozilla Mozilla is nonprofit. Fine, fine if Mozilla comes in and makes a real popular server. Uh, the the Mastodon administration itself has a very popular server with hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, it actually okay. Tumblr comes in. Uh, Matt Mullenweg's a good guy. We trust him, right? Uh, that's going to be okay. But at what point does somebody come in and make the big popular Mastodon server that then just ends up being the server everybody's on, and this whole thing is centralized, and the smaller servers fall by the wayside? Uh, I think one of the other big advantages is that you could also start your own server. Right now, that's not for everyone because it's complicated enough. 
But what if instead of just being the big popular server, Automatic, the folks who make WordPress, uh, create the WordPress of servers so that it would be easy for everyone to just roll their own instance and, and moderate it. Again, might not be for everybody, but you could provide tools that give you the legal shielding, that give you all the compliance issues, the maintenance stuff, the uptime, maybe even moderation tools uh, could be part of that. You get a few of those, a WordPress, a Squarespace, a Wix uh, of Mastodon servers, and then suddenly you've got a good ecosystem. There could be a business that doesn't have to be fully ad supported uh, in order to survive that keeps Mastodon flourishing and also preserve some of those benefits of being decentralized and allowing smaller niche servers to survive. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said there, Tom. Um, and I, I really think that it's going to take that um, for them to just maintain this type of growth. I just think it's untenable to have, you know, folks who are running these things, um, you know, as a service. I mean, the, you know, this is largely unpaid work. Um, I, I think that that I think that's just untenable at the growth that they're having because things are just going to happen because someone had to go to work. Someone had to, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were on vacation. And while they were on vacation, um, you know, havoc happened. So um, I, I think I think you're right. I think it could be a combination of the two to where you're going to have some company or some organization come in, stand up a massive server. And that allows some of the smaller servers to still kind of stay and do their own thing and, and be kind of a niche within the Mastodon world. I like Nick with a C calls it uh, the Samsung to Mastodon's Android or, 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 or yeah, uh, maybe to the protocol, to the activity pub uh, is the Android of the situation. But yeah, that's that, actually a good, good analogy. Yeah, it's a good one. I like that. Well, y'all might be surprised by this, but Nintendo's Game Boy is 33 years old. Man, still it has a run for president. I know, <laughs> and and it maybe it should. Uh, still has a devoted fan base. Um, I'm one of them. I, I don't have the original, but I do have a Game Boy somewhere behind me in Studio Redwood. One of those fans, though, is Sebastian Stax, who's created a plug-and-play device that lets gameplay from the handheld stream to a computer using USB and also be recorded without having to modify the console itself. Now, you might say, that's amazing. How did Sebastian do it? Uh, Sebastian uh, is, is a tinkerer. Earlier this year, uh, uh, created a custom cartridge that let the Game Boy stream video wirelessly, which Stack showed off by playing Star Wars on the screen, and also a hack that made the Game Boy capable of playing modern games, such as Grand Theft Auto V. I like that Nth Mike says, uh, are we still calling it Game Boy at this point? Shouldn't it be Game Man? Or game person. <laughs> yeah, game grown It's a up. whole adult, 33. <laughs> game adult. Game. Uh, anyway, not to take away from Sebastian Stax, uh, who uh, did a thing uh, that not only will be fun just because you can do it, but uh, Roger pointed out when we were talking about this before the show that, yeah, good for Twitch streamers. You want to stream some Game Boy. That's cool. It is cool. Yeah. Yeah, my first question is like, but why? <laughs> and all of you were like, because you can. <laughs> why not? And that's the fun of it. So it's a good reminder that, uh, you know, there there are things that are capable of being done. And Sebastian Stacks have, has given us a, a little fun thing to do over the holidays. Thank you, Sebastian Stacks, for your In service. Indeed. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Mark wrote in with thoughts on our discussion we had yesterday about that facial recognition and Madison Square Garden situation with the lawyer being uh, basically identified and thrown out. Mark says, policy and technology are not at odds here. They both function independently for good or bad. The issue with me is that once the technology is in place and they state it's for security and safety, how far do they stretch the definition to include we recognize you and don't want you here when it has nothing to do with the stated purpose of the tech. Mark says, I think the safety and security definition would include disruptive behavior at the venue, concealed weapon, something like that. Is the tech appropriate for that kind of venue? That's another discussion. Mark says, if they spotted someone famous, could they draw attention to that fact? Perhaps by bragging about who attended the show. What about using the tech to reward visitors somehow? Is that within the purview of their stated usage? I think not. Rob, you weren't with us uh, yesterday when we were talking about this. What's your take? So I watch everything, um, facial recognition, uh, very, very closely because there are ginormous issues with it. This was not a facial recognition story. Someone was recognized. It was by facial recognition. Um, and the story is about MSG's rules, not about the technology that they used. Um, 
But, uh, you know, Mark asked some pretty good questions. Uh, you know, this technology is there. They're using it. What else can it be used for? You know, if Fat Joe is at, a, you know, is at MSG or someone, you know, you know, J-Lo is at MSG. Are you going to use it, to, you know, to recognize her and then put the camera on her, uh, you know, in the stadium? Right. They do that already. But mm-hmm. could the facial recognition make it easier to find celebrities? That That is an interesting question on how this would work. Yeah. No, th- those are fair questions. Uh, what would happen if? They're not, to me, anything about what did happen, though. And, the, you know, th- not that you shouldn't be asking questions because that that's how we make sure that abuses don't happen is to talk about, like, okay, how do we guard against that? Uh, but I don't know that this particular story is is the one that the, is the smoking gun. Yeah, I don't think so at all. Because if it was a security guard that recognized the lawyer, the same thing would have happened. Yep. Yep. Well, thank well, you. Well, yeah, thank thank you and thank you, Mark, for writing in. If you have thoughts on anything we talk about on the show, anything we might talk about on a future show, do send them our way. We love feedback. Feedback at dailytechnewshow.com is where to send that email. Thanks to you, Rob Dunwood, for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with you. Oh, everybody can find me at the SMR Podcast, and that is smrpodcast.com, or over at my other podcast, The Tech John, that is thetechjawn.com. And, of course, I am on pretty much all the social medias um, at Rob Dunwood. Well, we thank you for being with us. We also thank our brand-new boss, Bob. Bob just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Bob. Yay. Well, thank Bob, literally, right now. Bob. (laughs) Bob is the best. Uh, Be like Bob. Yes, you've been thanked, Bob. Um, And, uh, you know, welcome. Uh, Glad to have you. Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We roll right into it after DTNS wraps up. But reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with a special holiday AMA show, Ask Us Anything, featuring Patrick Norton and Len Peralta joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>